Daniel Boone, the great frontiersman, moved into a particular part of Kentucky. And there he found a plot of land and he settled down. He thought they were staying there for a while, but it didn't last very long. He came in one day and he's told his wife, he says, uh, honey, he says, we've got to move, he said. Somebody has moved in within a mile from us and it's really starting to get crowded here. <laughs> here in Clearwater, to talk to those who have been here for many years to, to listen to the stories of how that even Bel Air Road was a dirt road at one time. It's hard to even imagine. To hear the stories of how there was hardly anybody here, but yet today we look at it in the surrounding areas and we're living in a crowded place. It's become crowded. It may be not as crowded as some other places that are out there, but we're getting crowded. But just because we live around a lot of people doesn't mean that we don't live around lonely people. There are many people who live in the city around a lot of people who are living purposeless, pointless lives. And those lives are filled with loneliness. You see, there's a difference in being alone and being lonely. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's good to be alone. All of us at one time or another will just need a break from people, right? Sometimes we like to get away with our families and take a vacation just, just to get away, just to be a, a deceit from other faces, right? Sometimes you just need a break. But I found that during that time that Teresa and I were separated from each other, even though we were in the same home, even though that uh, I had to keep my distance from her because of the radiation, that even though we're in the same home, sometimes it could feel lonely. Many of you have asked, how, how are we doing? And you even asked how I'm doing uh, after you asked how she's doing. And well, we couldn't wait until that seven to ten days was up so that we wouldn't feel lonely together in the same house, if you will. A lot of people this past year and this pandemic have felt times of loneliness. They were lonely and they became very, very depressed because of it. Physically, sometimes these people became very, very sick. You could be surrounded by people and yet still be lonely. Teddy Roosevelt said this about the presidency. He said, it is the loneliest job in the world. Now, wait a minute. The focus of the world's attention is upon you. What do you mean that you're lonely? Well, it's lonely at the top, he says. There are a lot of people that are lonely around us. It could be the person who comes into a particular church gathering, much like this, and finds themselves surrounded by people, and it could be that that person might say to themselves, well, I, I sure hope somebody speaks to me. I sure hope that people would speak to me at this service so that I don't feel lonely. I would hope that people would leave our service at any time and, and to feel like th that they didn't feel lonely that we were friendly people, that it felt like home, and that occasionally down the, through the years, I've gotten a note at one time or another that nobody spoke to me, that no one said anything. And I'm wondering, how, how is that even possible? That no one at all had spoken to you as we have always been proud of ourselves to be able to be as friendly as possible and to make sure that we greet everyone that comes in. 
I have to ask this question. Did that person sit next to me that felt lonely? Did that person sit in any particular section? Was I observant to that one who was visiting services on that particular Sunday? Could I tell that they maybe were flipping through the songbook and they couldn't find the song because there's such a list, they, which one is it? And they will go through each song to find the right one. Did I not reach out and, and point them to the right song to help them? Loneliness. People are reaching out. People are, are asking for someone to be a friend. In Psalm 142 and verse 4, it was the psalmist David that says something here that was truly tragic. He says, I looked on the right hand and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. How tragic. To think that nobody on earth cares about me. I think of all of us at one time or another who probably have repeated these words of the psalmist that is in Psalm 22 and verse 1 when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course we know that Jesus said that on the cross of Calvary, the very Son of God, saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus was tempted and he was tried in all points like we are. And that's how and why he relates to us. Yet without sin, and that's why he relates to God. And, and Jesus knew loneliness. There was a man who went to the doctor. To, he said, doctor, he goes, I'm, I'm mentally depressed. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know that there's physically anything wrong with me. I just, it's in my mind. And he goes, I'm just, uh, nothing makes me happy anymore. And I just don't know what to, what to do. I feel like everybody's against me. I can't find satisfaction in anything that I do. And the doctor thought about it for a minute. And he said, well, you know, he goes, uh, I don't have a pill for that, but here's what I would suggest to you, he says, the circus is in town. And he says, we went to that circus. And he said, there's a clown there that can make anybody laugh. He can put a smile on anyone that's feeling depressed or lonely at this time. And then the man responded back and he said, but doctor, but doctor, you don't understand. He says, I'm that clown. How tragic it is that even one who is to put smiles on other people's face could become mentally depressed and lonely. You see, there are a lot of people who pretend that everything's all right. They appear to be jolly and they feel good and, and act as if everything's okay. But deep down inside, these people are, are starving. They're hurting. The Bible addresses this problem, and, and there are some reasons for a loneliness, and we want to consider some of those in the next few moments, but it, it might help all of us to understand that we don't have to be lonely. And, and maybe we can help other people who are feeling lonely. In Genesis 1 and verse 27, we learned that we were created in the very image of God. And it's very important that we were made in the image of God. That's why we are precious in His sight, red, yellow, black, and white. Why? Because all men were created equal in the image of God. One thing I learned about this, that if God created man in his own image and he gave us the ability to choose, that makes God a social being, doesn't it? 
He, he wants us around him. He don't need us, but he wants us. He wants our love. And God loves interacting with us. And so he made us in his image. Therefore, we have that desire. Social beings. What, what is it that causes homes to break down? Husbands and wives will often divorce. And for what reason? The lack of communication or communicating the wrong thing. Sometimes it's called incompatibility. But we just simply did not communicate properly. Husbands and wives can live in the same house and they can grow apart because they're not communicating properly. And so sometimes children also can feel that their parents are distant, not willing to relate, not willing to open up, not willing to communicate with them. And that leads to loneliness. You see, when communication is lost, we become lonely. What happens for example, when death occurs, when a person loses his parents to death or when parents lose their children to death, they've lost that connection to that past and they feel that way. What about a man or a woman that loses their mate or her mate then? He or she feels that that tie, that uh, the present is it's gone. It's lost. What about the thought of the future? To think about all the things that we could have done, Lord willing. But now it's not there and the loneliness sets in. But you see, most people who live lives of loneliness do so because they do not believe that they are accepted. They do not believe that they are wanted they don't believe that anybody cares, that nobody loves them. And as a result, they tend to blame their relatives. They blame their friends. They'll blame anyone that just happens to walk up at the wrong time. They even blame the church because of the rejection that they perceive because they feel lonely. Loneliness comes about because a person can feel insecure about himself or herself and if one is lonely then he most likely is either temporarily or at least for an extended period of time that has forgotten his reason for living in Genesis chapter 1 remember it was God who said let there be light and the, there was light no big deal for God we believe in the creation God made heaven no, bill, no big deal for God right I mean, he made the sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the night, and the, the stars also. No big deal for God. It's all set. But you have thought about how the language changed when he gets down to man. On day six, let us be being the divine Godhead, he says, let us create man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1.26. Let him have the dominion. Why does he have dominion? Because he's the direct creation of God. Therefore, he's the dominant creation of God and he's the distinguished creation of God. Let him have dominion. God's going to have a, a different kind of relationship with the one that he calls man, you see. Not with the animals, but with man. He, ha he will have a different relationship with him because, you see, he, give, he gave him a soul. A soul that dwells within him. And thus we have a consciousness of God. I don't care who we are. There is a consciousness that we have of God. That's why we believe in eternity. Not just because the Bible tells us that. Just not because the Bible makes it clear that there is a heaven. We believe in it because it dwells within us. We want to believe that. We were made to believe that. And that's the consciousness of God. 
And one thing you will notice about also about God's creation is that God got personally involved when he created man. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, he formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils. And man became a living soul. He then formed the woman from the side of man. You see, God is personally involved. And so man begins a relationship with God. But what happened in Genesis 3? We know that the devil is always up to meanness. Always interested in in hindering relationships between God and man. He comes on the scene. When sinner enters the picture, what happens? Well, the relationship is hindered. Because God is holy. And now man is unholy. So that's why we rejoice to know that through Christ, that that relationship that was once together, been severed by sin, is now back into that right relationship. Once again, restored. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Nobody is left out, but communication was hindered with God. Man enjoyed a life of an an opportunity to walk with God every day. It was a very close relationship, but sin entered. And that communication was hindered. And now as a result of that, what happened? Well, in Genesis 3, we notice that all of a sudden, man is fearful and is afraid. Look at verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. Verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to notice something very important here. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise... She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. But notice verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. All of a sudden, the relationship is different. It is no longer the same. The first couple now is experiencing this thing that we're talking about this morning called loneliness. You can take loneliness all the way back to its roots and you'll find that it comes from an estrangement from God. That doesn't mean just because there are lonely people that these people are ranked sinners. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that they are evil people if they are lonely. No, all of us experience loneliness and by so doing, we don't give up the faith that we have in God. But you trace it back to its roots right here in Genesis chapter 3. And so when a person leaves God and leaves God out, when a person takes his focus off the divine, he likely will feel loneliness. And so there's a universal problem here. But really it is a problem that can be cured if only we understand some biblical principles that we can put into practice. There are a couple of passages that I believe can really help us with this problem of loneliness and maybe able to help others as well. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 10. I mean, Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is speaking here, and here's what he says. Matthew 10, verse 39. He makes this very profound statement. He says, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now that's an interesting statement here. 
Jesus is speaking, or is Jesus speaking of martyrdom, martyrdom here? Is he saying that the only way that you can follow me is that you will have to give up your life for me physically? No. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Losing self in Christ, that's what he's saying. Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Paul tells us. You see, when one loses himself in Christ, you see, he's no longer preoccupied with his self. He's no longer interested in just promoting self. What he then begins to do is what God wants to see fulfilled in, our, in all of our lives is to take the focus off ourselves, to take a, the focus off yourself and start looking outward. It is wonderful to do well. God wants us to succeed, but he doesn't want us to become disinterested in people as we do that. He's not interested in succeeding at the expense of others, no. But he is interested in us taking the focus off ourselves and put it on somebody else. But how do we do that? Do you remember in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 where Peter says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I, I give this to God and now I can focus my attention on somebody else. Isn't that a wonderful, is that not a wonderful passage for us as Christians to give it to God? You can go into the closet of prayer. You can give this to God who loves and cares about me, you. Jesus had his trials when he lived here on this earth, but he never lost his focus and his focus was always on others. But notice Romans chapter 12. And here's one of the greatest chapters, if you will, ever written on Christian living. Romans chapter 12. And I want you to notice several passages beginning in verse 3 to help us deal with this problem of loneliness. In Notice verse 3 of Romans 12. He says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now we are living in a very egocentric age, an age of fame and friendships, that in order to get ahead that many will run over other people, leaving them in the dust. Well, that's not true to Christian principle. And really what is going to happen is that this person who lives this way will end up living lonely in their lives. The quickest way to loneliness is a person who has conceded sense of himself. No doubt. Or a person who drowns himself in self-pity that person is always going to end up lonely. What is the proper view of self as you study Romans 12 and other passages? You, you need to understand that God says we are somebody. We were made in His image. I am somebody, but I'm not the only body, right? Right? The other people, too, were created in the image of God, who I should care about and love, that I should be concerned about. And so we need to have the proper view of self, and that means that I need to know who I really am. I am somebody, but not the only body. And then to be caught up in something bigger than myself. Look at verse 5 of Romans 12. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members of one another. Now, of course, that's the church and the church is the body of Christ, members one of another, but all are one in unity. That is why we are working toward the same goal, not caught up in just getting our own way, 
but many being one. That takes every person working in his or her own place, fulfilling his or her own role to carry out this plan. How many of us so many times are filled with the idea that it's all about each one of us individually? Maybe the author, the creator says, you've forgotten me. And how many, how many people who do think it's all about themselves, they travel the road of loneliness because they're not willing to reach out to others. They don't include other people in their lives, including God. But the interesting verse in Acts 17, 28 says, For in Him we live and move and have our being. In order to overcome this problem of loneliness, we had to have the proper view of self. The second thing is, is that we had to be true to self. Not only must we have the proper view of self, but to be true to self. Look at verse 9 of Romans 12. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. It was Shakespeare who once said, to thine own self be true, right? You see, when you refuse to love the good, when we refuse to despise the evil, even the evil of a bitter spirit, and a lot of people have a root of bitterness within them, you lose respect to the respectable. And not only that, you lose respect for yourself as well. There's the, that's a pathway that leads to loneliness, no doubt. But be true to yourself and have the proper view of self. Be caught up in something bigger than yourself and be true to yourself and then take the focus off of self. Look at verse 12 of Romans 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hosp hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind, one toward another, mind not the high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. One reason that people feel lonely is that through constant complaining, negativity, sympathy seeking, is that they could never win any friends. No one wants to be around them. No one. All that negativity, we hear enough of that on the news. But the bottom line is this. If that describes you, no one wants to be around you. You may be lonely for a particular reason. Lonely because the focus is upon yourself. You say, yeah, well, but I've been through some particular problems and nobody else knows what it's like. Oh, but wait a minute. Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. He says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That says we all have our trials. They, they might not all be similar. I mean, they all may be similar, but not exactly alike. You get that right. And at certain periods of time, each one of us may be going through a more difficult, difficult trial. Some people are going through a difficult trial right now, greater than something that, that I am having to bear. And I'm certainly not going to scoff at what they're going through at all. But you need to be angry. But don't, you don't need to be angry at me because my time will come, you see. But the point is this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, but God is faithful. He is able. That's the point. You see that through all of those trials that are so similar in, in nature, God is still able to help us overcome them. And, and through the, those trials, we will be drawn closer to Him. That's the point 
of the trial, isn't it? And you know where your greatest ministry in life will be? That's helping other people endure a trial that you've already been to been through. I've told you before, sometimes a person will come to me about some bad news and this is what's happening in my life. And, but because of their particular trial, I will immediately, immediately think of a person that I know that was going through that same trial. And I say, you need to go talk to that person. There, there could be, they, they've already been through this and, and they might be able to help you through because they were able to help themselves through a marriage situation, if you're having problems, I know of a couple who have had the same problem, but, but they've overcome it. You need to go and you need to talk to them. Financial problems. I know of somebody who's been where you are. Just go and see them. You see, your ministry will become helping somebody else to overcome or endure what you have already had and overcome. So don't shut people out. Welcome people into your life. That's what Jesus did. Brother Bailey once said, he says, the reason Jesus was so interesting to others is because he was so interested in them. I like that. I remember one preacher who passed away a few years ago. You know him well as he preached here for just a few years. He had a great life. He had a great career. He knew the Bible inside and out, upwards, downwards, and, and over and through. But he was in his office one day, and a member of the local congregation called him, and she was so angry. She said, I, I've been sick, and, and I've been in the hospital. Nobody called me from the church. You, you didn't. The elders of the church didn't. Nobody else called. He said, he says, Excuse me, excuse me, but I didn't even know you were sick. How was I supposed to know that you were sick and that you were in the hospital? Well, how are you feeling now? Are you feeling better? I'm glad that, I'm glad that you were able to overcome that. You're doing much better now. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into that kitchen of yours and I want you to bake that famous cherry pie that you make that is so wonderful. And I want you to take that pie and I want you to go and find somebody that's sick and I want you to take that to them. She got mad and hung up right there on the phone. A little bit later, she called him back. She said, I want you to know something, preacher. She said, I, I did what you asked me to do. Not because I wanted to, but out of spite. <laughs> she said, I did just exactly what you told me. And she said, I want to thank you. Because when I was in the kitchen and I made that pie and I took it to somebody else who was sick, do you know what I felt? I felt blessed. I found out that there could be people in a worse situation than my own. And I also learned to take the focus off myself and quit taking pity on myself and put it and help others now. Isn't that what Jesus was always trying to teach us? Overcoming loneliness is a real problem, yes. It's difficult to overcome this. It's not easy, but some things Paul makes very clear for us in order to do that, and is that we need to have a proper view of self and being caught up in something bigger than ourselves. And not only that, to be true to self and then take the focus off ourselves. How quick we are to judge somebody else when we have not walked in their shoes. Sound like an old Indian prayer. You probably heard that. But it's much easier for us to condemn, right, than to convert. And sometimes we cut ourselves off from people unnecessarily and we choose to be lonely. Don't let that happen. I, I want to close this morning with a, with a special verse. And I want you to go with me to, to John chapter 16. That was our, our scripture reading this morning. John chapter 16 because I do believe that our Lord experienced loneliness. And, and we know that he did 
Because in John 16 and verse 32, if you will, notice he's, what he says here. He's getting close to Calvary. And he, he says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. What is Jesus predicting here? He says, in view of the cross, you will be tested. And he said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to leave my side. You might say that you're not going to leave my side. I think Peter said, no, Lord, I'll be right there. I'll be right beside you. And then guess what? Jesus said, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. He wasn't there. Matthew 26, 56, we learned that all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. Jesus says, you're going to lead me, every man, to his own and shall leave me alone. But notice the last part of that verse, verse 32. He says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. No man cares for my soul. Oh, I know somebody cares, friend. I can assure you. But if you perceive that nobody around you cares, you can always have this blessed assurance that God is right there who does care. God cares. I know that song that we like to sing sometimes where no one stands alone. I hold my hand all the way every hour, every day from here to the great unknown. Take my hand. Let me stand where no one stands alone. Where is that place where no one stands alone? Jesus says it's right there at the shadow of the cross, right? As he was going to Calvary, everybody will leave me. And I believe that includes everybody that's here even this morning. And they, they left him and we left him. But he says, I'm not alone because the Father is with me. We all will travel some lonely paths in this life. Don't become bitter over that. Don't let that cause you to be skeptical of God. Don't lose your faith. And remember, even if it appears that everyone has left you, there is one that has not, and that is God and His very Son, Jesus.